Hey, welcome everybody to our uh, Friday session uh, of the Winter School. Uh, my name is Antonio Cerani from ISTP, and I will be chairing this short session of the day. Um, uh, as always, the uh, rules are that uh, you are uh, invited to type your questions in the chat and uh, uh, at the end of the talk, uh, uh, there will be a discussion session in which uh, your questions will be answered. Uh, for the viewers who are following us from uh, the uh, YouTube live stream, uh, you can uh, write down your questions in the chat and uh, uh, I will read them out uh, for you in the end. Okay, so with that, uh, I will leave the floor to Andrea Rinaldo from the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. Uh, will we'll deliver the first of his uh, uh, three lectures. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Antonio. And uh, we're like, well, welcome everybody. Let me share my screen. I'll be mostly uh, counting on that. And um, uh, I may be a little, little bit uh, abrupt in, in stopping at the 45th minute, but uh, I'm confident that because I have three lectures, I can compensate the material should I be somewhat um, uh, uh, get carried away <laughs> in the presentation because I kind of like the subject quite a bit. So let me um, let me uh, show you what's the rationale. The network says ecological corridors, and the subtitle reads uh, species, populations, and pathogens. And um, and uh, in fact, uh, I think that uh, the, the the boy from Bangladesh, about which about whom I'd be speculating later on in the third lecture in particular, was trying to convince me that the mighty waters of the Magna River couldn't carry the, uh, uh, a pathogen that, uh, 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 in fact, it could infect him from cholera. And given that this happened like a couple of hundred meters downstream of the largest real hospital in the world, one wonders whether our limited knowledge, uh, uh, in fact, is a permanent liability on our ability to put a price tag on ecosystem services. So um, here I'll be uh, advocating for a particular uh, robustness of our uh, capabilities of predicting what happens in a case of a particular substrate for ecological interactions, which is through the uh, channel network. And uh, um, I am told that these modern, this is not a seminar, it's supposed to be a lecture. At times I'll try to be somewhat technical. And um, what I can say is that, uh, uh, that whatever I'll be doing, and I think, and I gather that what Marino Gatto will be doing as well in his lectures is taken from a book we published. Uh, it came out like this month, on maybe the end of November. And uh, if anybody's interested, of course, details and much details, but maybe too much details contained therein. And it, that not by chance, uh, the picture which I took in Bangladesh during feed work, in fact, uh, is a very big example. So um, uh, River Networks as Ecological Corridors, this picture is taken in my, uh, in my beloved uh, hometown, it's uh, surrounding the city of Venice. These are tidal networks, not river networks. Just for those of you more versed in geomorphology would have spotted that immediately. But anyway, the coexistence of the built and the natural environment suggests that um, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a long-standing issue that has been exploited uh, with a limited understanding for a long, long time. And in fact, um, my pitch will be that uh, essentially Dendritic substrates for ecological interaction, in particular that of, of uh, 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 river networks, of course, of which this is a particular, if you please, uh, uh, geomorphological relevant exception, but it's so beautiful, the picture that I couldn't resist, in fact, even showing those uh, white spots, which are nets, fishermen's net, uh, nets, in fact. But anyways, um, my pitch is for dendritic structures for ecological interaction that bear rather fundamental uh, consequences on a number of processes, in particular patterns of biodiversity, but uh, much more in my view, to control the spread of uh, say a number of things, the species, okay, populations like dynamics of populations into the uh, uh, fluvial connections and from there into models of infections like uh, COVID-19 as Marina would be doing. So the plan of my first 45 minutes is why, in fact, I, I believe that we can uh, move from abs rather abstract models of um, uh, 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 the dendritic ecosystem, yet with some important constraints, and why they are important in the quantitative evaluation of 
ecosystem services. In particular, I'll be uh, trying to show you progressively through uh, uh, abstract theoretical work, more refined theoretical work, and laboratory and field work that we carried out in my lab in Lausanne, that um, um, directional dispersal and the spatial ecology uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, concert a special situation for uh, on an essential bearing on form and function of a river network, that is fluvial ecosystems in, in a sense, uh, but uh, as we'll try to uh, show much more than that. Uh, but um, the issue would be, again, the dynamics of fluvial ecosystem services, not today, biological invasions, not today, populations migrations, not today, and then transmission of waterborne disease. Today we'll set the premise and um, uh, for these to be verified on practical cases. And again, if I may choose a punchline, I'm a hydrologist uh, at heart, and uh, so I, I guess we're inching towards a fair distribution of water. Pillars of hydrology are floods, droughts, and a fair distribution of water. And um, this, I think, would be an important step in that direction. So let me first uh, start uh, uh, chatting a bit about something of which, um, uh, in particular, Ignacio Rodriguez uh, and myself have been working for like uh, uh, 35 years at this point. Uh, we studied at length the substrate for ecological interactions, the fluvial landscape, because one of the issues that um, we keep having in mind and echoing one of the organizers of these, uh, of these uh, 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 winter schools, Simon Levine, who's in the, who's in the, the importance of whose work can never be overestimated in ecology and beyond, is that um, uh, although natural ecosystems are characterized by a striking diversity of form and function, uh, at very many, very quite a few times, uh, these often they exhibit, uh, they exhibit uh, uh, deep similarity, deep structural similarities. Uh, uh, that at times they emerge across scales of space, time, and ecological complexity. So we wonder whether certain universal features that appear in the dendritic structures, like the ones that I'll be pitching in for the fact that are uh, statistically the same, regardless of climate, vegetation, exposed lithology, you name it. There is um, a self-organizing process beyond this, which is super strong, and self-organizing in the sense that um, it will generate realizations that are statistically identical. Um, regardless of there's no fine, there's no celestial tuning of parameters that allow them to happen. It happens uh, nonetheless. So it's not a critical phenomenon, but it's self-organized critical phenomenon. And this, for those of you that have uh, been uh, at ICTP for a long time, know how important it has been in the cultural activities there. So let me uh, talk to you about the river landscape and why, in fact, this is going to be brief but um, heartfelt. We have quite a few tools. This is taken from, again, Google Maps and what you take a picture. What you can do nowadays, you can filter and realize what vegetation is, and you can actually expose the terrain to the point that uh, you can have LIDAR or LIDAR, whatever you want to call it, maps, in which essentially you have the size of a stamp, um, uh, which is centimeters at this point, once you have filtered the vegetation, you have um, uh, the, the surface of the terrain in an exquisite detail, which you see in this case is exactly the same bend of the Amazon. And um, the uh, accuracy on the vertical direction is now becoming uh, more than enough to generate description of details in geomorphology that really changed the ball game forever. And this, um, so this is another picture uh, at the same time, once you filter the vegetation, the detail of geomorphology which you're having there, um, uh, objectively manipulated and, um, and uh, automatically retrieved and remotely retrieved, it's really phenomenal over a range of scale, which is unheard of. So essentially what you have, I'm still attached to the old picture, the first one we took out in 1989 or whatever, 90, whatever it was, et cetera. This is a small catchment um, at the, in which the restitution was of your few um, uh, hundred like square kilometers. And this was given the pixel size, which you have by uh, general tools, it will be like of the other, this kind of 30 by 30 meters. And um, the accuracy in the third dimension was of the order like half a meter. So what happens is that essentially you have a surface remotely acquired and objectively manipulated that tells you how you can calculate uh, gradients. And gradients means steepest descent direction. So you have a field Z sub I, which is a scalar, right? 
Um, and uh, you can calculate the vector, which is the gradient, which is the steepest descent direction, which um, by all means in uh, hydrogen geomorphology makes sense to assume that the, that the strongest force is gravity by orders of magnitude. So steepest descent direction is also the direction of the flow direction. So aggregation paths can be devised directly uh, uh, via the shape of this kind. I mean, I'm essentially engrossing uh, a particular of that. So you can uh, delineate a line of this kind. And we have a trick, which is a useful trick, in fact, of um, using a scaling relation for tracing the black line that shows the mainstream in here, which is a well-known Leopoldian rule for the scaling of a width of a river channel. This is a trick for showing how the system behaves, but certainly it has a major implication. You can calculate elevations, you can calculate Laplacians, like uh, let's say essentially the average over the nearest neighbors in a place, so you can easily decide what's the sign of the system, that is whether the surface is concave down or concave up. You have some sort of tricks to the point that we, we assume uh, early on and essentially because of a statistically, statistical uh, uh, well-worn argument, essentially our theorem is that square root of two is equal to one, that is take as a gradient, the steepest descent direction, you know, exceptions can be, can be generated. So essentially you extract um, a, a the river network from data over the scales around the order of a meter, even less than that now, to the order of thousands of kilometers. Still, we are talking about um, the so-called runoff generating part of a landscape, where in fact you do have aggregation, you don't have a transportation zoning, we have no significant injection, but still you're talking about six clean orders of magnitude that can be ground truth quite easily. And quite a few, at the time we used to go at the physics conference in particular in Trieste. And it seems that the data set over which we started learning how nature works, in fact, uh, hardly find a match than in the case of a fluvial basin. So it's something we know uh, fairly well. So essentially we define the master variable for this, which is total contributing area at the site. Like in this case, you have 12 connected pixels upstairs. That is, you essentially have, and it's a typical equation which you had in the aggregation process with the injection. If you assume that one is the size of a pixel, whatever square meters you have, you have, I have a connectivity matrix uh, in the system. And I'm getting to the point that now um, a system of design, this is a, well, I, I uh, skipped an important issue or which I shall return. I'm assuming that this is a tree that is in every node, you have a unique path um, leading to that node by different directions, you don't have loops essentially. And I'll get back to that. Well, it's also historically quite important because uh, that's the assumption that was made in the first manipulation of a, of a system as we see it. And yet it proved a lucky shot because we didn't search for like uh, optimal configuration of some kind by searching uh, loopy structures. And it turned out to be a fluke. But anyways, what you have is that a WJI means whether it's, it's something which you have a one, if this J is connected to I, I'm sorry, if I is connected to J and zero vice versa. That is in this case here, you bring in a guy who carries a weight one, a guy who carries a gate, uh, a, a, a weight one and a guy who carries a weight one plus one that makes four. If you move here, you, you add one plus four plus three plus three, plus one, and you get 12 pixels a second. And this means that uh, the, this is a, a, a quantity which introduces and the statistical physicist uh, among you has spotted immediately. This is a non-local interaction, which is uh, applying uh, locally. And this has plenty of consequences, of course. Now, what is interesting is that is, uh, this is a tree. This connectivity matrix has um, all zero eigenvalues. So you know that immediately. So if by any chance you, the, you try to perturb this configuration generating loops, you would know immediately with elementary numerical uh, checks. A source has area equal to one and the like. So one is the basic scale, which is delta squared, the size of this guy here. I'm sorry, I trivialized it a little bit, but it shows how we can, in fact, show a remarkable capability we have to remotely acquire and exactly manipulate. Description is a super accurate of natural landforms over, I would say up to six order of magnitude. And what's interesting here, I removed the scale bar. And one of the main tenets, and that's the book where Ignacio and I wrote years back, which was uh, where received, in fact, is still 
used uh, in quite a few even graduate classes or for its well cited uh, like so what, what I'm saying is that if you remove a scale bar um, you really don't know whether this is a large or this is a small catchment this could be the Amazon it could be a small creek in the Dolomites nearby because nature tends to produce those shapes uh, in a remarkably similar shape regardless again of climate regardless of vegetation cover exposed lithology you name it or any kind of perturbation the system has. How do I know that? Well, um, actually we can specialize a little bit, uh, the, uh, a little bit more morphology, geomorphological um, extraction, uh, the geomorphological consideration, how to extract the proper channeled part of a landscape. Uh, for instance, this is a, the, the network that connects all the concave sides, the one for which Nabla square of ZI is larger than zero, concave up. So eliminate the dots here that have a concave sides, which has a well-defined uh, geomorphological reason to happen. The concave sites are called colluvium in geology and geomorphology. Or you can take a subset of that, which is further refined by some sort of a criterion with a threshold that you had in there. You can read in the signatures, for instance, of past climates as see in a minute. So essentially, if I enlarge the thing, you have the channeled pixels, which are the proper parts which are um, uh, part of the domain of a fluvial domain, read the networks as ecological corridors, as we said. So again, uh, this is what we have seen. And the key result is that you take this as a master variable, that is, that you take, you consider that the total contributing area at any pixel, at any site, is a random variable whose probability distribution, in this case, by no chance, we use a probability of exceedance to avoid a promise of binning, as you may know, or for which we may return in case, is essentially proportional to uh, uh, this value a to a power, so infinitely popular terms like power laws, which is essentially dictating what Simon Levy was saying about the, the uh, deep structural similarities that emerge across scales of space, and in this case, not in time, but equally well if you have activity on the network. So essentially, oops, sorry, going in the wrong direction. So uh, this is the, uh, what happens. Uh, of course, if you take um, sub catchments, you sub sample within a basin, you have that the maximum area will be limited to the maximum size of the, of the, uh, of the, of the sub basin you have. But what you see that if you take nested uh, sub bases bigger and bigger, you see that the argument you have in the system, in reality, you base uh, an argument is called the finite size scaling which is something which is well known to a statistical physicists in which you see that essentially you can have these curves collapsing directly um, onto one another, showing that in fact, the deep and remarkable um, uh, 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 similarity emerging across scales is a well established fact over which there is a significant literature. Consequences that the system, so it's a well known fractal, if you have signatures, et cetera, um, uh, uh, the geometrical language as Benoit Mendelbrot, whom um, we miss a lot and uh, to whom we pay respects all the time for these visionary ideas. Uh, it's a common name for that. Uh, so it's the language that nature speaks. And you, what you have is that if you take, for instance, gross features of a domain uh, for interactions like uh, uh, transverse and, and horizontal length, you have relationship like the priority distributions uh, are with a remarkably consistent coefficient of less than 0.5, highly non-trivial, or the lengths to the source of any fund are well codified and well known. And linked scaling exponents fully characterize the network forms, in fact. So these are, you have, you have uh, there's a zoo of, of cases that have been investigated in the early 90s, and uh, this is a remarkably uh, uh, robust result that we've shown. Now, the finite size argument also allows you to get uh, interesting features. For instance, if a finite size argument applies, the ratio of consecutive moments of a, of a finite size scaling, uh, uh, finite size scaling um, distribution produces a, a particular relationship which shows that regardless of the value of the subsequent moments that you're using, um, you should have uh, uh, different uh, uh, the same exponent essentially. So this is a particular kind of a fractal machine which allows us to calculate the elongation of a catchment, which is something which uh, uh, without math, but uh, that Mendelbrot spotted on early. And these are the data is for you to uh, show what happens, etc. So essentially uh, a consistency across scale, it can be done because you can use these to generate, for instance, 
um, variations in time of um, uh, the features that generate the network. But what um, we really know at this point is that uh, essentially the spatial imprinting then generates to the contributing area, which rightly called the master variable for the, uh, for the system is what generates something like, this is what happened to Mount St. Helens after a few minutes after the first rainfall, in fact. So the imprinting um, has been like Canyon-like, but it will stay forever, the planar imprinting of the system that settled the issue. Or um, if you take, for instance, Martian landforms that you apply to the same things, et cetera, what you seem to be, or what you see, in fact, as something fluid has to be um, operating in eroding those surfaces. But on this, I should not insist, even for saying that we have tools for, and then I'm back to the, not really fluvial, but um, tidal networks, it can tools in which by studying the landscape, you can extract lands, uh, landforms of a very uh, uh, fine scale indeed. And uh, so with, these are many other things that we've been studying for years. Or for instance, if you take like, this looks like a, a photograph, but it's a digital terrain map of an accurate one in which you can actually start devising or whether you can discuss whether these are natural or artificial forms, in fact. So that's what we have. Again, this is a digital terrain map for our the treasure, our data set that uh, you can, in effect, show how nature works from, again, 10 centimeters easily in the fluvial landscape to uh, thousands of kilometers. And um, uh, that opens the, the thing to, I still allow myself to have like five minutes on networks, and then I move on to the first exploitation of that, uh, it would be if whether all trees are equal. And um, uh, the idea is that um, uh, uh, whether the loopless property is particularly distinctive is something also important. And uh, we see why uh, comparing networks is important. For instance, I'm claiming that uh, these networks, not this one, but the three of them, for instance, have the same topological properties. And what distinguishes them are metric properties of a different thing, but it doesn't take, I mean, a scientist to see that the piano network, which I'm showing here, is different from this one. But they are topologically identical, indistinguishable. So this deserves some, uh, some uh, extra thinking. This is piano network, which is something on which we worked a lot, and it was um, essentially devised by uh, Mandelbrot, is an exact fractal, uh, you have a hell of a lot of properties which are hydrologically and geomorphologically relevant that can be solved exactly for this construct. Um, essentially because they map uh, uh, multifractality, for instance, exactly. It's a binomial multiplicative process. Um, in this case, it's uh, characterizing something which is very important for hydrology, it's a benchmark. But again, the topology is um, uh, the same with the networks, so it allows you to get exact solution for properties that are topologically dominated. And we we'll see next class that there are a few. When I'm spending some time on uh, um, optimal channel networks, uh, which is something which we invented in Nacional, and uh, this is a tool through which you essentially calculate a spanning tree. A tree has to be, in fact, um, over, over a given domain. In this case, square, but it could be anything. It could be with boundary condition, which are periodic boundary conditions, whatever you want to have it. And, uh, so the idea is the following, uh, there is um, uh, an exact uh, uh, statement taken from the general landscape evolution equation, which is nothing but uh, uh, the mass balance of an of a, uh, elevation field Z, in which you have um, uh, uh, that in steady state condition and the small gradient approximation. And in the case of reparameterization invariance, in fact, you get that uh, it, it, there exists a Hamiltonian of the configuration of the system which you're seeing here which minimizes energy dissipation, uh, which is essentially uh, related to the master variable, the non-local variable at any place raised to a power gamma. Now on this, I shall not spend time because this is that well digested. If you, if you want, you can find uh, the uh, exact solution in a certain place, et cetera. But what I'm saying is that what is relevant for us is that there is a zoo of possible cases that we know of. For instance, if gamma is equal to two, these are called random resistor networks that have been studied by engineers in particular for a long, long time. S is the set of, see the configuration of the system is essentially the number of uh, L square sides, the total contributing area, which is embedding the uh, connectivity structure and the aggregation level. Now, in the case of gamma equal to one, this is a very interesting thing. These are called the 
uh, well, mapping the so-called abelian sand piles in self-organization, that is, you essentially have a network which minimizes the mean length of the outlet. And what is interesting is that all directed networks, in fact, have the same uh, energy dissipation as gamma is equal to one. But mostly interesting is that if you assume that this is a problem, a problem which you multiply flow time a gradient, like uh, you have normally the power dissipation, the energy dissipation, uh, as you want to call it, um, then A is proportional to the landscape forming discharge. It's a well-known result in hydrology. And the slope is proportional to area to a power which is less than one. So essentially, you have a class called of host optimal channel networks that uh, obey this property. Instead, if you put gamma equal to zero, you have spanning networks, and it's a different uh, ball game in its own. All I'm saying is, if you keep going in the system, what you have, in fact, in some case, an issue is that from any initial condition, you can essentially rearrange the system by disconnecting a place, getting a new tree going to other direction, and checking whether they, uh, well, you can actually find whether you may accept uh, changes uh, in this case, which is the basis from this procedure. Or you can put some probability a la Gibbs, like simulated annealing, and you can actually generate these uh, figures here. Now, an interesting point, and I want to follow up on that, is you, you can calculate, in the case of trees, the true thermodynamic entropy. That is, you can count the number log of a number of states that have the same energy, which scale with a certain uh, condition. And total energy dissipation scales with a, uh, with a different expo uh, exponent, which is larger than one. So in the uh, thermodynamic limit, if the size of a network is big enough, energy dissipation is also minimizing uh, thermodynamic entropy. Uh, so these are the figures that uh, we can generate. And um, in fact, you can show that if you start making good comparisons, you can calculate uh, fairly well how these exponents are perfectly matched. In fact, so match scaling exponents are the true tool for comparing different trees. Uh, that's it also an interesting point, Dave, another lecture that you have. Amos Maritana was the lead, uh, the lead author and a former ICTP professor of a, uh, of a ground state, uh, the scaling property of a ground state for this case. And um, what is interesting, in fact, um, the scaling exponents for the ground states are not the ones we observe in nature, nor the ones that we get in the case of so-called uh, uh, opti feasible optimality, that is optimality which is um, uh, 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 readily, that is optimality, which is uh, dynamically accessible. Randomness is not a thing. So essentially this is an even growth, which is an entirely random dominated choice. And if you make a good comparison of these two networks, look at the different boundary conditions, they look similar, but if you look carefully, they are not like your eyes telling you. And uh, these are the two different conditions. These two scale differently. They are both a uh, network and these the chance that the system has to reach a ground state is nil in practice. And this can be seen progressively by relaxing boundary conditions, size, and the likes. So um, um, uh, these are the typical uh, networks over which I shall be uh, talking about. And um, I will jump now to the, I'm showing, I'm, uh, I'm skipping details, essentially on the fact on why in fact networks are uh, I, I may get back to that uh, um, and later on in one of the following uh, uh, classes. I think it's more important that I move on, but the idea is that I hope I convey, that can give you the material on that, is that it's a co some coherent thinking on how, in fact, uh, we have similarities, structural similarities emerging in the substrate for ecological interaction, emerging across scales uh, of space. So uh, the first thing that uh, we had in mind is using uh, on a subject of this kind, uh, uh, the uh, neutral theory of biodiversity. Why neutral theory of biodiversity? You may know that the neutral theory was originally proposed uh, in complete analogy with the neutral theory of molecular evolution, uh, which assumes that um, uh, gene mutations are selectively neutral. That is, new genes are demographically equivalent to the old genes. And uh, they do not give any advantage in terms of decreased mortality and or increased fertility. And uh, it's a paradigm that dominated uh, the molecular processes and still does for a long time. Um, the main advocate, in fact, for a neutral theory of biodiversity was a colleague from Princeton now at UCLA, Hubble, who wrote the fundamental book about the neutral theory of biodiversity. It is 
he was asking at uh, whether um, the idea uh, starting from uh, five from works uh, done on uh, tropical forests in which essentially he proposed to uh, have mutations replaced by the occurrence of new species in the landscape so um, the idea is that uh, it was a revolutionary one because essentially what you do you assume that all species are considered um, uh, equivalent at per capita level and on which I shall build more in lecture two. But what I'm showing you, and I hopefully I will convey the, uh, the, uh, my, my main idea is that um, um, the, uh, if you have a neutral process over a particular uh, topo topology of a substrate, this has consequences. So the conditions for a species to occupy a site, for instance, and maintain a population are the dispersal ability of a species, the habitat suitability and the susceptibility to any kind of biotic uh, killing of any kind, etc. But um, uh, we want to see, okay, now, of course, we have conditions to, uh, to grow and maintain a viable population in a place. But um, uh, what happens, that was the key question, so knowing that we know a lot now about the recurring characters of fluvial landscapes, in fact, which have a spanning tree over which interactions occur, what would be the consequence of the extension of the neutral theory of biodiversity to space explicit ecological setting, but in the particular case of a river land? So essentially the experiment I'll be showing you now uh, to introduce the following discussions is one in which you have essentially, or suppose you have a lattice, okay, which in a hydrologic term called savannas, because essentially what you have is that every single uh, node uh, is allowed to interact with the nearest neighbors. Whereas in any chunk of a river network, um, you can have two uh, sites that are neighbors, um, uh, nearest neighbors, but they are completely connectivity wise, they take a very, very long distance from one another. So essentially introduced because of a directional dispersal, which is embedded in the network structure with or without drift, because that's, uh, that's the point, um, you have a system in which uh, 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 the uh, connectivity matrix is a completely different picture. So we can apply the spatial ecology sensor, like uh, Tillman, the famous work with Kareva in 1997, um, is extended in the model which I'll be discussing now, extended to embed the topology of the substrate. So this is what happens in setting the simplest possible model. So you have, uh, assume a distribution of colors, and assume the color is a species. This is what uh, uh, in social science and statistical physics was called the Volter model in the beginning. So um, assume that uh, at random you kill any existing color at any place, and uh, you have two options. With probability ni, you replace it by one of the colors that is not existing in the particular place. And with probability one minus ni, and this is a very small number, you assume that in this case, um, the color that will be taken out of this will be the one in which all nearest neighbor, I mean, the most abundant of the colors in your nearest neighborhood. Now, this is interesting because you assume that there's no stronger species than another, right? So you assume that if this is a political opinion, there's no political opinion uh, will be stronger than the others. And it will be simply the, the what um, you actually have as the, uh, it's the wisdom of the a, of a numbers, of a large number of uh, you have in the system. So um, in this, every now and then, like every 10 to the five uh, uh, trials, et cetera, the, the uh, point you, you choose at random and you kill um, is just parachuted from, uh, uh, from uh, outside the domains, mimicking either speciation or migration or immigration from a different places. So the only difference within the two um, uh, uh, is essentially the topology of a connection. And when we saw this, we, we got kind of excited because we said, look, what happens is that the only ingredient you have changed is the uh, matrix, is the neighborhood, the definition of neighborhood. In one case, the one you see uh, on the left was open and thereby more open to interactions. And the second one was more protected in the sense it was due to the presence of the uh, network itself. Now, what is interesting is that if you just make it quantitative, but you have it here, uh, you essentially have not only you have the different degrees of irregularity in the boundaries, which is proposed, but in this case, which is uh, the network system here, the neutral system here, what is clearly that any statistical 
measure that you have of the distribution of the colors uh, is essentially uh, completely changed. And the rank abundance curve shows that the biodiversity of a network system um, is much bigger. And uh, of course, the first thing you say, okay, is this a realistic model, uh, the neutral model uh, of, a, of a fluvial ecosystem, of a fluvial uh, stream uh, microbial ecosystem uh, uh, distribution or not? Well, it so happens that um, um, patterns um, uh, may not be, uh, neutral patterns do not require neutral process perhaps, or equifinality issues can pitch in. But the fact is, this was an intriguing suggestion early on. It happened in 2009 before we embarked on this study, et cetera. But for us, it was worth uh, checking. Why this is interesting? Because this is a result that is absolutely robust with respect to a number of generalizations. Namely, this is 1.1 species. But this could be evolving into a meta population model. It's one node because a local community with a certain number of species, the same rules of engagement for the interactions. And you can also have is that you can relax the possibility that it's only the nearest neighbors uh, giving you by sheer majority the new colonizer in a place in which you don't parachute the new species. And, um, and the result is the same. So a, a, a dendritic uh, substrate for interactions changes completely the ball game regardless of the number of assumptions. Still, in the obvious assumption that uh, you're assuming that all colors are equally valid, and you're assuming that all species are equivalent to the per capita level. But we thought it was interesting. And the first thing that we did, we applied the same rule, um, uh, individual-based uh, but um, uh, or meta-community-based, but with a kernel, that is the radius of influence of the area over which you average uh, progressively to get the majority replacing the place, could be immediate neighborhood or mean field, that is the one you essentially go and check what happens in the system. You can do that on a 2D lattice, you can do it on a network, you can do it on a 3D lattice, on a 3D network. And much to our surprise, what have we found? Okay, one good measure to see what happens in this case uh, would be um, essentially uh, related to how long would a certain color last from onset when it's created or in a particular place, or um, it has a local extinction. And um, this is called the persistence time of a color or of a species into a landscape, only in this case affected by technicalities like the structure of a network. And much to our surprise, the distribution, whatever you want to call it, certainly there is a huge, there is a huge uh, uh, range of, uh, 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 scales that covered by, by power law in this case, show that there is a distinct and unmistakable effect of the topology of the substrate for a topological interaction. So um, in our case, um, we took on to a first empirical check because it's interesting uh, thing we did too, in fact. So we studied the, the, the we had like 41 daily uh, values, 41 year of observation of breeding birds in North America into a place. And here you see the, what is this, um, the uh, persistence time in this case, meaning suppose that you are in this area here, I should have, yeah, here it is. I should have in this area here, you count in those observational sites, you count uh, how many times here you spotted for the first time a particular bird, and here for a number of years you haven't. So these are independent persistent times. And you can study the value that you have at different level of aggregation, for instance. Or you can do the uh, cancer spray herbace herbaceous um, uh, uh, plants, et cetera. So you can characterize the thing. It's long story short, but what I'm saying is that you can isolate the effect of the finiteness of a sample, which you have an atom of probability if you have a species that's been continuously observed, for instance, and you can characterize this um, uh, interesting feature. So long story short, what you have is that you confirm what we have seen. Topology means a lot. And topology of a substrate for interactions has an effect. And to the point that you start, for instance, aggregating in different spaces, you can transform this scaling effect, exponent of a lifetime, into a distribution of biodiversity. So essentially, by taking coarse-grained um, uh, versions of the same space, you can find the probability distribution of uh, the survival, how it behaves under coarse grain, and thereby generating a true species area relationship. 
And the next step of which I want to um, show you, and on this I'll be relatively fast, it's only the last five minutes of a class, we said, okay, say, look, um, of course, and you talk to an ecologist, say, hey, but this is bullshit. I mean, species are not equal at per capita level, how you can do that, etc." And yet we thought early on, there was something um, uh, to, I mean, manifest to be completely false, a, 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 a topological effect of a substrate of the nature, the recursive nature of a form and function, which is embedded in the structure of even networks, regardless of whatever, it is truly a universal feature. So we decided to um, decide to test on, in my lab, uh, these with living communities, in which there's nothing neutral. There is absolutely nothing neutral. So essentially what we do is just, uh, we choose, for instance, you see how rudimentary the city is, we should have had the money to buy a robot and the, in the absence of robot to have, so this is essentially what we have in the, in the uh, uh, lattice in which nearest neighbors are the four nearest neighbors. I mean, the, in which nearest neighbors are the topological ones, the adjacent things and the structure in which these two guys are not nearest neighbors. And we did that by brute force. This is Francesco Carrara, now ATZ, and this is Enrico Bertuzzo, now a professor at the University of Venice. Now, long story short, this is what we got. Replicas were as many as needed, and uh, this is the experiment that you have in the random network system that you have, or in the thing that you have. And the color, essentially, is a measure of species richness. So in this, uh, the theoretical idea was telling us, look, guys, uh, there's something which pertains to the fact that you have a certain topology of the connections. It's regardless of everything else. It's, but the, the prediction came directly from a neutral model. Um, if, if you have like um, a lattice of interactions, this doesn't happen experimentally. And this, uh, again, uh, this is a living community. I'm talking about, uh, in this case, the the, uh, the uh, I'm, I'm giving you the details, I took a note someplace here about what is the experimental community. I'm talking about 21 uh, protozoan species um, uh, in which uh, we had, I'm sorry, nine protozoan species, one rotifer, which is a multicellular one, and a set of freshwater bacteria as food resource in the place. And uh, the uh, dispersal was done uh, manually, but it was done essentially according to the things, etc. And I can give you details if you care for it. An interesting tool was also published in another set of painfully uh, uh, conducted experiments in which you essentially get, okay, now suppose that we take into account the fact that habitat capacity in a river is a hierarchical, okay? So essentially you assume that the medium in any single well uh, depends on the number of um, upstream sides. So you have a hierarchical structure. Or you get system in which the same total amount of medium is randomly distributed or in which you take a uniform distribution of the system. Believe it or not, um, the hierarchical system is a completely different uh, structure. So um, and that's the take for the next uh, classes. I'm saying that um, uh, whether neutral models or models of anything as uh, modeling or riparian vegetation, modeling of species diversity, et cetera, we're talking about the landscape um, quite a bit. Uh, when you have an environmental matrix, which is made by nodes and connections, um, uh, the substrate matters. And I'll show you how this, uh, in fact, uh, has a say on the oriented graph is something which we give. We don't assign a network interaction. This is given by the, by the geometry of the system. And, um, and uh, in good timing, in fact, uh, I'm showing you the conclusion, a general conclusion, but I'm essentially what I have shown is that eco-hydrological footprints of rivers as ecological corridors were suspected from early uh, abstract theoretical work and uh, confirmed by empirical analysis uh, uh, on uh, a particular set of uh, persistence times measured for breeding birds or plants in the cancer spray or experimental work done on living communities um, in this place. So I'm ready for your questions. Of course, in the following classes, what I'll be doing, I'm talking about species, about the biological invasions. I'll be showing you why biological invasion is slowed uh, by bifurcating structure of a system. And then I'm talking about disease, which is an interesting point. Disease is tackled in this manner in spatial explicit manner. Okay, let me check whether I have chats. 
Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm having serious problems with electricity supplies. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a question about the electricity supply. I cannot help you. I'm sorry. So we, we are ready to take questions from the audience. If you want to speak, uh, just uh, raise uh, your hand in the list of participants and uh, I can give you the floor. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Miguel Rodriguez. Miguel. Hello. Uh, Hello, Miguel. That that was a that was a fantastic lecture. Thank you uh, for this last part uh, where you do this uh, experiments with microorganisms moving from well to well. Um, will that will that uh, pattern be robust to different degrees of base diversity? Will that be true for much larger? Uh, values of richness, for example, in those. Okay, that's a super uh, question. Experiment. Super question. Now, uh, the, the, uh, uh, well, we have experimented with a varying number of protists, in fact, because we needed to have uh, a size of thing. And, and I have to say, the protists have been a good uh, model organism, in fact, for these kind of studies for a long, long time. And if you look at what uh, there's a number, Holyoke, uh, uh, Florian Altermatt, which was actually working with us on these, etc., they work a lot on uh, so called uh, dendritic. Uh, substrates for interaction. But what the hell? The dendrites were just a pipe and a few bifurcations. That's not the river network. That's what I keep saying. And I think I convinced Florian, who followed us, etc., to the point that, in fact, uh, he put on, uh, uh, you'll find a note, he put an open source code for having his own networks in the place. Because you have to have the number of sites, the number of sites that you have are constrained by the total area. It's not that you can assign them uh, uh, independently. The connectivity, which is suited to a fluvial ecosystem, uh, is a specific one, highly constrained one, a highly recurrent one. It's not one which had like a pipe and a few uh, branching patterns in there. And um, so the question is that we have experimented with different number of processes, but we haven't explored it uh, a hell of a lot. All I'm saying is that, as you will see, uh, soon after these kind of confirmation, we got more and more enthusiastic. I got an ERC grant, and uh, we started having lots of people working on different aspects of that, about which I'll be talking in the next two classes. And uh, I'll be showing how we did species, we did uh, 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 population migration, which is a fascinating subject I'll be talking to you because we start from migrations, human migrations in the 19th century. It's a long shot. And, uh, and then I'll be talking about disease. Believe it or not, with the same tools, we started uh, simulating spatial explicit models of cholera. Well, waterborne, of course, it has to be, right? The pathogen and whatever has the pathogen living in it. Uh, or uh, proliferative kidney disease in fish. So anyways, we haven't experimented a lot, a lot more in the lab. Mind you, at the time, I didn't have the money for the robot. So Francesco and Enrico stayed out long nights in, in pipetting from one side to the other. And that's what... It's typical, you know, it, it's, um, uh, uh, you see, typical of professors say, what are these details? <laughs> it's not detail, but it works a lot. Hey, thanks. We, uh, we have a question from uh, Susi Barghese. Do you want to uh, speak for yourself or do you wish us to read your question on the chat? Ah, Susi, I, I saw, I see it. I see it here. You want to, to, to repeat it, Susie, yourself? Otherwise, I read it. No, you can go ahead and if you could understand if you can understand the question. Okay, the question is: Are there evidence for biodiversity reduction whenever rivers are diverted or dams or construction are constructed? Of course, fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, uh, question, Susie. Yes, there is. In fact, a group of fish biologists um, in Spain. Uh, it's Pepe Barquin, I think, is a guy in Santander that uh, published, it, published quite extensively on the study of how biodiversity is impacted. By, it's, it's actually common sense. It, it's common sense on a number of counts. For instance, I could tell you that there are a number of studies, especially the biofilm guys, are very prominent on that. If you change, if you modulate yeah, yeah. the natural sequence of stream flows, you change the ecosystem, period. Uh, that's a yeah, fact. The can we use it for, for example, uh, impact studies before, prior to constructing dams to say that, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But that's, I haven't done it, but the paper Barkin and his group has done it quite a bit, actually. Yeah. 
Thank but you so much. I mean, I mean it just but even a common sense. Uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's known by uh, the, what the dam does besides the interruption and the change in connectivity, which is directly reproducible in the case of this, because essentially you change at any downstream point the total contributing area, right? But the sequence of stream flows is not proportional to area anymore. So essentially, you change the structure of the engine for interactions. And, uh, and uh, I mean, it, it's known, people that study the biofilms know that, uh, which is the, the, the basis, the engine for the ecological interactions in the, in the microbial ecosystems or fluvial microbial ecosystems. And so there is evidence for that. Yes, the answer is yes. I haven't done it. No, I haven't done it. We have a question from Vitor Suprak. Okay, within this model, the river capes, uh, could uh, we add the effects of structural changes in river curvature due to coastal erosion or river, okay, uh, or rivers driven by deforestation or riverside vegetation? Okay, there are two different issues. Um, first, uh, um, the, I'm referring, okay, it's two separate issues. Uh, to the first one, the answer is no, why? Because the uh, recurrent properties we see in rivers uh, do not apply generally. They apply the so-called runoff producing areas. So the, the river structure is essentially the runoff producing area where the landscape form and discharge is proportional to the total contributing area at the point, the non-local quantity. Then for instance, if you enter the desert like the Colorado River does after uh, uh, Glen Canyon Dam, for instance, then you have a place in which you have no injection of water. So essentially the transportation thing is dominated by uh, geomorphological process and morphodynamics, which is not related to the aggregation process at all. And then you have a delta of the estuary, which is the distributary system, which is again uh, governed by different rules. What I'm looking here is that there are not producing areas, we mind you, it's not the whole of the river basin, but it is um, something which can easily extend to scales of the order of thousands of kilometers in size. If you're talking about deforestation of riverside vegetation, of course, yes. And I work on that. I'll be talking about briefly uh, about models of vegetation uh, over which we worked a lot, actually. So the answer is yes to the second one. Is that okay, Vitor? Oops, do you hear me? Uh, we cannot safely assume that Vitor is satisfied. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Do we have uh, any further question from the audience? Can I ask one more one more question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, in your in your uh, persistent time persistence time distributions uh, patterns, uh, you you show that the the these networks these river networks sit somewhere between one yeah. D and two D fully connected uh, uh, grids. Uh, can can will these be predicted by the dimensions in that fractal structure? Absolutely. That's, that's, that's a, the, 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 it's a good, again, a very good comment. The, uh, what happens is that um, it's the topology of a substrate that matters in determining the persistence size. So you, have, you sit in a point, you close your eyes, close your ears, and you measure for how long the color stays there. Okay. You find that if you do that, of course, every side is a, a different persistence time from the onset of a of the species, we're not measuring abundance here. So we don't measure the number of colors. So uh, color red in this place, yes, for how long it stays and you measure it. So every uh, particular from uh, onset to local extinction is one value of a random variable persistence time, local persistence time. You do that for every single thing. Uh, but what I'm saying is that the, uh, the game of simulating that in a couple of hours, you can do that because it's absolutely trivial, right? Uh, if you give by hand, for instance, the connectivity, which, which is slightly more complicated, but okay, but the essence is that one. What happens is that what you see is that depending on the topology of the system that you have, you don't know anything of what's going on in the model, etc. You simply count. And you see that those distributions, once you start making big enough to have enough statistics, etc., behave completely different. And that is the counterpart in which this is telling you, look, there may be something deep going on here. Because what we are saying is that depending on how I'm connected, uh, it's how I'm exposed to interactions. And how, in fact, uh, the, the, the distribution of my energy is completely, completely different, changes radically. And what is super interesting is that this topological effect has been, it's a, a singled out exactly, in fact. But what is interesting, if you look at data, you know, it's a tricky thing because 
if you look at the data, for instance, look at breeding birds in an area like of uh, Georgia, God knows what. You know, Audubon Society started like uh, 50 years ago in collecting those, the, the network of the bird watchers is a serious business in the, in the North, in North United States and meritoriously one. What happens is that uh, what you had is that, okay, let's suppose the Cardinal, that was seen in this area now that it hasn't been seen uh, on, on a, like this year, he has been spotted. Next year, he hasn't. So essentially you measure what happens locally. And then what you do, you can uh, make it a bigger area. So it changes because it may be local extinction can be here and not in the nearest. So at the continental scale, okay, if you assume there's no migration or cardinals, et cetera, it's speciation that you're measuring. It's very, it's the, 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 uh, you can call it a speciation rate or a true speciation rate. So what I'm saying is that um, uh, you can empirically, there is also an issue because if you have a finite sample in terms of length, huh, what happens is that um, you may ask yourself, okay, look, uh, if you see uh, throughout uh, uh, always this, uh, uh, you, you always spot the same bird in the same place, you have an atom probability of one, okay? And that is very important because you see how this atom is reducing with the size of a sample. It's telling you a hell of a lot of the underlying distribution. And uh, so being careful, but you see, I'm, I'm showing you in 45 minutes, like four or five years of work. And, uh, but again, if you, if you, if you uh, care for that, I'm um, ask your library to buy the book because we spent a hell of a lot of time in putting it together. Thank okay. you. I think we have time for one couple of questions more, and then we'll close. Okay, uh, one to one is asking, could you please remind me what is the difference in topological structure between the savannas and the OCN? Okay, savannas means that in every side, uh, your nearest neighbors are the four um, uh, uh, nearest neighbors in the coordinate direction. That is north, south, east, and west. That's all you check for, okay? So once you kill in, in a place a system, you replace um, the color you have in there by the most uh, abundant color in the nearest neighbors, and if all three, if all four values are different, you choose at random, okay? In the case of the OCN, you have a directional dispersal. So you have uh, essentially drainage direction that tell you who's connected with whom. So you may easily have that because of this directed structure, nearest neighbors topographically may not be nearest neighbors in terms of interaction. And that's the drainage direction, which you get directly from the, from the uh, landscape elevation. There's another one, Zebsa, Rabah. Always I think that there is a limit number of species that coexist in this structure, and then all about spatial structure. That's a good question too, uh, uh, Zebsa. What I'm saying is that they, I'm talking about the abstract model now in which one site is one species, okay? But you can generalize this into a meta-community model, which I'll be explaining next class, in which for every node, you have a meta-community, a local community. It is a community of communities. So you can actually uh, calculate carrying capacity uh, if, you're if you're worried about that, you can calculate logistic curves, et cetera. You can put this into a, into a spatial ecology framework, like uh, the spatial ecology framework that uh, the Tillman, the mighty Tillman and Kareva put together. Only thing, what we provide, it's uh, those recurrent features of channel network, which you know better than anybody, because we worked for 20 years on those. So the answer to your question is, uh, of course, there's a carrying capacity on each node. You bypass it, but you see the pattern explained by the, uh, by the individual based, uh, 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 say kernel one, that is only nearest neighbors thing, et cetera, is telling you a story, which is conferred by making the kernel, say mean field, like the entire structure of the catchment or uh, number of species fixed or number of species variable or whatever. The result, that is that the pattern is affected, uh, resists and is general. Thank you. Okay, so maybe it's time for us to call an end to this first uh, lecture. And uh, uh, thank you, Andrea. Thank uh, you so much, Antonio. Beautiful lecture. Uh,